Welcome back to the Plowcast. I'm Susanna Black, Senior Editor at Plow. And I'm Peter Mobson, Editor-in-Chief at Plow. Today, we'll be talking with Esther Maria Magnus about her new book with Plow, With or Without Me, A Memoir of Losing and Finding. We'll also be talking with an Italian astronomer, Spirello Alighieri, about his ancestor's vision of the world as he describes it in his new book, The Sun and the Other Stars of Dante Alighieri. Well, we're delighted to have Esther Maria Magnus with us on the podcast today. Esther Maria is the author of a new Plow book, With or Without Me, A Memoir of Losing and Finding, which we're going to uh, be talking about today. There's an excerpt from that book in the current issue of Plow Quarterly um, entitled The Strange Love of a Strange God. And we'll be quite blunt with you right up front, uh, dear listeners, that we would like you to go read the excerpt and then go buy the book. It is really good. It's amazing. And, I, you know, I was, uh, I think, four years ago at the Frankfurt Book Fair, and I just remember reading it on the plane home to New York and being so incredibly moved by it and knowing by the time that the plane landed um, that we wanted to publish this book. So thank you for writing it, and welcome, Esther Maria. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, reading my book in German. must have been hard. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I lived over there for seven years, so we, we won't do the podcast in German, though, so I don't have to show my German uh, up for what it is. Um, you know, and it's funny... So this is a book that touches on some of the deepest things in human life, um, faith, death, loss, things that could sound very difficult. And what you write about in the book is often very raw. And yet the experience of reading the book, Suzanne and I were commenting, is, is a pleasure, is a, a joy. It reads um, so beautifully. It's It's a strange kind of... An enjoyment, and I was sort of like asking myself as I was reading it, like why, like it, it's it. You're describing, you know, these experiences that are the, some of the worst and most devastating experiences, um, not just in terms of what happens practically, but in terms of you know internal struggle um, that that we can experience. Um, this is real book of Ecclesiastes stuff, but at the same time, the way that you write the humor like the strange humor and the 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 playfulness of the language which is a very strange thing to sort of say um and the kind of pleasure of the accuracy of what you're describing i think that's that might be part of the pleasure part of the pleasure is just like there's there's like this shock of recognition um of someone who is actually not cutting corners and not being dishonest about human experience. Um, I think that's kind of at least part of why it is a book that you want to keep reading, even though it's so painful to read. Yeah, I um, when you did the translation and I had to reread it, I was a little bit shocked because I forgot how direct or how, yeah, um, I, I felt it was almost cruel somehow. And I think that, uh, it's, it's because I started to write it two years after my brother died. And um, I was still in this, um, I had the feeling that I don't need to, um, um, or I was still, everything, the, the pain was just real for me. And now I, I, I started to think about if I would write it today like this, and I think I would be much kinder. It wouldn't be a book like this anymore, but I, I had the feeling when I read it, it's so cruel somehow. It is cruel, it is raw, but in a way that um, is also what makes it so convincing and, and so trustworthy. So we've been teasing our listeners, um, talking about this book, what is the story that you're telling? I would say it's about the, and that's how I see it, about the um, the God question. Yeah, or even when I was when I was a small child and I was um, staying at the sea, and um, you know these moments when you experience something 
that is um, that is just strange and on the one hand you experience yourself but on the other hand you experience something that is totally not yourself something very strange outside of you like the whole world or the cosmos or whatever and um and these moments give you or yeah leave a question inside of you if and for, when i was very small the, that was the question if is, is is that God, if, if I'm experiencing what the grown-ups told me? Is there a God the way Christians describe him? And um, this question is in the book, not asked theoretically, but, um, or examined theoretically, but um, it is asked, do you say real or for real? Um, because my whole existence, you could say, became this question when my father was diagnosed with cancer when I was 14. And um, yeah, and after he died, um, after many years of extreme ups and downs, I, um, I, I broke with God and the question suddenly turned like not, it was then if there is God or if there is no God, why do I suffer from love? Um, how do I get rid of the love I feel for my father? I don't need that love. It makes me weak and, and depressed and it puts me in danger. And, um, and then I asked the question, how do I get rid of all the wrong hopes and concepts of God and humans and of myself? You know, I, I felt how my whole concept of mind, do you say that? I'm not sure. Or the, but my whole concept of existence was kind of soaked in um, or soaked with the European Jewish Christian um, philosophy. And um, even, even the modern ideas of uh, believing in God, or if you, if you stop believing in God, were, in my opinion, still sitting on this Jewish Christian branch. So I really try to empty my thoughts of, of this and try to be a real, an, an atheist, to live like an atheist and um, to, to stop um, sitting on these, uh, I don't know, you could say um, romantic leftovers in my, in my thoughts. And um, in the book, then I come to the point um, that is described in at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, um, where it said, I don't know if I translate it correctly, um, but um, you know, after God created the world or after every day, it says, and God saw that it was good. And I overstepped this point um, backwards. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. I went behind that judgment into that void that lay before it and um this is something you really shouldn't do you can do this theoretically but you can't do it for real and so what um at the end i was just insecure and i lost identity and couldn't say the word i anymore and from there a new faith started again but I can't describe the way you know how how i came into the, how, how i got this new faith because it's it's so difficult to, because it was not the one turning point. In a weird way, the book that it reminded me the most of was C.S. Lewis's Surprised by Joy, which is a very strange thing to say because your book is very painful and not at all kind of sweet and tweety and British like C.S. Lewis. But what it is, the way that it is similar is that it is a, it's an existential quest and um, it it describes you're kind of like, um, as you as you described it very well, sort of um, a, almost a series of philosophical exercises that you did in response to the pain of of your father's loss um, and your experience of feeling betrayed by God, who you know hadn't saved him, um, in order to kind of almost unmake yourself. And then you you got to the point of kind of being unmade, and then you were kind of remade. And the way that you know, you're, you know, you, you were raised Christian-ish and that, you know, you had, you knew God and the God that you know now is the same one that you knew then. Um, but you describe a kind of like first a, a breakup 
and then a kind of like deliberate um, removal of self almost sort of, you know, if, if you're going to really not believe in God, then you end up not believing in external reality also. <laughs> and, and so like stepping back um, from that void into being told that existence is good and receiving his word in that um, is just a, it's a profoundly painful and beautiful um, sort of journey to go on with you. It felt like being on, a, you know, I, I, it's a captivating book and it, it feels like it does something to you while you read it. Like I found myself like praying. Um, I found myself like thanking God for his existence while I was reading it. Um, and it, you know, it's not a, there are so many conversion stories that are structured like intellectual detective stories. They're like apologetics. Um, they have rational arguments. And Lewis, you know, Lewis's is a little bit like that. But yours really, it doesn't have that kind of rationalist edge, except a tiny bit in the sense of um, if you're going to say that anything exists at all, you end up, you know, including yourself. It, you know, it's not Descartes, but it's not totally not Descartes either. Um, you kind of do get back to a, a belief, um, and not just a belief in God, but like, you know, the, the God that you believe in is a God who loves you, and there's no, there's nothing, there's, there's no sort of abstract um, belief that God exists without a belief in him as the one who loves you. That's sort of how it felt to me. Um, do you want to, I, it's so, it's such a weird thing to sort of talk about this book after reading, like people should just read the book, like that, why are we talking about it? Um, but at the same time, I, I don't know, I, I do have some other questions, I guess. Um, one is the Christianity that you return to is Catholic Christianity, you're a Catholic. Um, and you were, you're half and half, right? My father was pr uh, Protestant, uh, um, oh. yeah. And um, my mother was Catholic. But when you returned to faith, when you came back to God and kind of let him remake you, you you became, you sort of found yourself a Catholic. At the beginning, you know, and that's also, that might be interesting about the book too, is at the beginning I was only, you know, asking myself if there is a God. And when I turned again towards him, I turned to this, you know, foreign love that I was hoping was out there. And, but I did, I was not a Christian, you know, I first I solved or I, I answered the gospel, the God question for myself. And so I turned to God and at the beginning I thought, I, I had no idea where to go with what I believed. I thought I had, maybe I'm, I even called um, in a synagogue to talk to, um, how do you say a Jewish priest? What is it? A, a, a rabbi. rabbi. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I tried, uh, I wanted to talk to um, with him about my, my faith because I did not know where I was standing, you know, who, and, um, and then it took me um, a while to understand the, the reason why I started to accept the idea that it might be possible that Jesus has something to do with God came while I was, uh, during my study, I was working on, on, a, on a piece, how do you say, a, 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 on a, yeah, on a work or on a text. An uh, essay? Yeah, and uh, yeah, maybe an essay about the question about, um, the concept of God, how it changed um, after the Holocaust, after the beginning of the Holocaust, and then how it developed, how, um, how Jewish theology was, was asking these questions. And, and um, I found a Jewish philosopher, he's called Hans Jonas, and he, was, um, he wrote a book about the concept of God. And he, the, everything that he wrote about God was... Um, was I, I felt that I 
totally understand what he meant, but I didn't. He, he said something like in, in face of, if you look at the Holocaust, you can't, um, usually you would give three attributes. Do you say three attributes um, to God? You would say he is all good, almighty and understandable um, because he says what he wants. He tells his people what he wants, so he's understandable. And if you look at the Holocaust, you can't say that all these three things go together anymore. If he's um, all good and almighty, and you look at the Holocaust, you just can't understand him anymore. And if he's understandable and almighty, you have to say he can't be good um, facing the Holocaust. And so that's what it was all about. And then he came to the, to, um, the idea that you might lose one of these three things. And he said, um, the almightiness might go and I, because and then he he creates a, a very interesting idea of how God had to in in order to to let the world um, come into beginning he had to make space for the world you know that something can exist without him you know in front of him uh, and and I had the feeling while I was reading it I said yeah that's exactly what I believe but and then I woke up in the night and I understood that everything that he's describing is also what I believe about God, but I would say that that's the description of Christ, you know, like getting into, let reality happen on you and suffer from reality if you make space for reality in inside of you. And, and I had the feeling, I think he's describing Christ, or I had the feeling that it might be Christ or what people say about Christ. So, that's the beginning. That's how I started to think there might be something about God and Christ because I didn't like Jesus before when I didn't, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't find him sympathetic. Do you say that? Everything. And um, yeah, so this, that was part of it. And then I started to, to listen to, I went to some, to the Protestant church and listened to the, to the speeches and they are talking they are talking much more than catholic churches do you know the priests and the <laughs> so because i really needed to know what what people think i wanted to know what other because i was so excited that there might be other people out there who know the same god and so i was very excited going there and listen to them again and to know what what they what they have to say and if they experienced maybe the same things that I know and so on. And um, that was very interesting. But at the end, I noticed I was missing in all of these churches, I was missing one thing. And that was um, uh, the, that you kneel down. You know, when I went to the Protestant church, there were no, the bench, the, do you say the benches were not prepared for people to kneel. Yeah. It was just there for sitting and staying and listening but not for the kneeling. And that was, it's a very, um, how do you say, trivial or um, trivial? Do you say trivial? Trivial. Trivial yeah. reason at the beginning. But that was the reason why I started to go back to Catholic church was I need, I don't know, I trust that there is space for the kneeling. And so that's why I went there. So that was, and it's it's very complicated. To, I just noticed then, I started to notice that my sense of the way I, I, the way I sense reality, if you can say that, is Catholic. Like the, the combination or the, the, um, the, the expectance of the um, Holy Spirit in reality, like it is in the Eucharist and how earnest reality is. And yeah. You describe in the book how you went through at least a, a, a feeling of atheism, right? Of, uh, and you've mentioned that today that you, you, you tried to be atheist. Uh, do you, and it was almost, like a subjective condition that mm -hmm. that that God isn't there, He hasn't been there for me, and um, I I don't sense His presence. Mm -hmm. Is that something that recurs? Do you do you still feel that way sometimes? 
Yeah. Yeah, I have. Um, it's very easy to get me if people if I see people suffering. Like the last the last time was I think last year or one and a half years ago, a friend of mine died. She was a Christian too, and she was um, and um, she was a strong believer, and she was praying. She was uh, she married very late because she was. And she was really waiting for the love of her life. And um, then she found him and then they couldn't get pregnant and they prayed a lot. And then she suddenly, it was amazing because she suddenly got pregnant and got the baby, although the doctors said it wouldn't work. And so she had this baby and then the child was three years old and she had to start to say goodbye to him or to, to that girl. And, um, and then she died and yeah, it's not only these things, but that was the last time that um, when I felt that my faith is, is trembling. It, I think if you have these problems with your faith, it's more like it's, it's like a re relationship problem or a trust problem that you have with God. And it, um, it can only heal if you... Um, talk to him about it and if you um if you it sounds stupid but if you share it with him and yeah but that was a very i mean that was a very um how you say offensichtlich obvious obvious situation of you know getting um getting that that the pain was that the that the face was hurt again but i yeah i have these phases once in a while and um it's i it's it's a nightmare for me i really hate it and um there's then there's only this you know as i as i try to explain this step back into the void you know before everything before the existence of everything i i just know in these moments of losing my faith i only know okay i can't go back there i i know i know that i can't not believe because it guides me into nothing and and i'm not strong enough like i think some atheists are strong enough or like themselves in or love themselves enough to know that it's enough that their opinion about themselves carries them or that they are um that their opinion about what is good and what is evil carries them enough but I'm not, I don't have this secureness in, inside of me. You know, there's always this question of what does the beatitude mean when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit? And I, it hadn't occurred to me before, but like maybe being poor in spirit is not being someone who, whose opinion that like we need, we need God's opinion that our existence is good in order to be. And we, we don't have the kind of, like, we don't think that we can be fully existentialist in a kind of like, um, let me say yes to my own existence with nothing behind that. Like that, that might be someone who's rich in spirit, but I know that's not me. I'm, I need God's opinion that I'm, that it is good that I exist. Since, since the book came out in Germany, you must have had, uh, and you've done quite a bit of public speaking in various venues. And I'm sure you must have met with other people, particularly younger people, um, struggling with faith, whether they believe in God. How do those conversations go? Uh, what, what do you tell them? When I spoke publicly about these questions, it was always, like with people who didn't believe in God, it was then always after my, my readings, mostly. Always with some journalists from print media. And then it usually was like, I, I didn't speak to them. It was more that they were telling me their stories. So, yeah, I think I mostly listened to what they said. Oh, yeah, and there was one, I remember, there was one, I think it was a journalist, he wrote me that he still that he also 
thinks that the truth is important and he believes in truth that there you know that truth exists and i had the feeling but he's he still is an atheist and because i wrote that truth is god or god is truth and i think there is uh, was the difference between him and me and i told him that that i believe the truth is real you know that it's not a concept that we can agree on now but it is something real even if we don't agree on it and that's much stronger and then um then just i have the feeling you know from an atheistic view it's all just a theoretically it's it's a playing you know we play with words and if you i i started i read a little bit derrida in you know who um is talking about the destructurization about um, the language. And I have the feeling that this is what's happening. You know, if we just play with the language, if it's not about something substantial or something that really is there, then it's just like air, you know? It's just like some smells that you have, but they they fade and it's, it's nothing real. I was not raised Christian. I, I came to faith um, later on. And like thinking about, it it is like a kind um thinking about the kind of more philosophical aspects of it, it happens throughout and 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 keeps happening um and it, it doesn't feel like something that i can put aside um but one of the things that kind of i guess i've noticed um about reality is that if you do you know if you you know through you know, having lots of conversations with atheists, um, is that if you do have this sense of like, well, we ought to believe what's true, like even even that sense of like obligation to let's grit, if God doesn't exist, let's just grit our teeth and like face that because we ought to believe what's true. That sense of ought, like where does, even the obligation to seek truth is itself, like it's, it, it flips you back to Christianity. Like you can't, if, if you believe that there is an, an obligation on you to seek truth, feeling that call, like that, um, that thing within you that says, I can't believe something that's not true. I can't just lie to myself. That call to believe the truth ends up being a call back to God because where does where does that ought live? Like where how can there be such a thing as ought if we're just material? Um that's also, I don't know, that's something that, that's always struck me. Um how's how's thing how have things changed for you since the time that you wrote the book? Um I guess you, you I think you've talked a little bit about the you you feel as that would you might write it in a more gentle way now. The book was published at the same time. I think I gave birth to my first child in the same month when the book was published. And now um, like four children later, <laughs> I am, um, I'm a little bit more, I think I, yeah, it changed, but it might change again. I, I don't know, um, but I would, I would write more friendly now. There is something, though, to, you know, you described it as cruel and and there's an aspect of the book, though, that reminds me, you know, of the book of Job, which is also cruel. Uh, and that's, I think, its strength and what makes it so unlike um, other books I've read uh, that deal with the same questions and it's beautifully written. It's if, if it's cruel, it's a very beautiful, it's a lingu- as, a, as a language matter, a, a beautiful cruelty. Could you talk just about the literary influences um, that were on you as you wrote? Definitely, there's definitely one author. It's not the way he is writing, but he helped me to finish the book because. I noticed, you know, when I started to write the book, I noticed I can't continue or I can't write it without writing about my about myself. And um, I didn't like the idea of publishing something about myself and writing about myself. 
But I noticed if I don't want to stay theoretically, if I don't want to write about the God question, all these, these things theoretically, I have to tell uh, um, parts of my story and what I know. And, um, and I really hated doing this. I've been asked very often in Germany if, um, if it was therapy for me, but it just, it wasn't. I, it, I think it was even counterproductive. But um, when, uh, during the time I wrote about it, I wanted to, I, I came to the point that I wanted to quit. And, um, but then the, the only reason why I didn't quit was that I had spent all the money I got in advance. So, <laughs> so I was spending nights lying in bed thinking, oh, how, how can I pay this money back? because I couldn't, I can't continue. I can't, write, I can't write about myself anymore. It's stupid and the book is leading nowhere. And I really hated it. And um, yeah, that was, that was at a, at a time, the only reason why I had to continue. But what, who helped me was, um, he's called, it's a German artist. He's called Christoph Schlingensief um, and he, died of cancer later. I, I think he had cancer while I was writing the book and he wrote a book about himself and he was talking about, you have to show your wounds. And um, then I was looking and I, I thought, okay, yeah, that might be true. You just have to, I don't know, you just do it and you just finish it. And I, and I mean, as a Christian, this is like in the Catholic church, they're all in every Catholic church, there's a cross with Christ on it who shows his wounds. So it's not something totally um, foreign, you know, or it shouldn't be something totally foreign for us Christians to, to write about what we know or what we've suffered. And um, yeah, that helped me to, to continue writing it. And the language I think is influenced um, by German, by uh, fairy tales, the German fairy tales. And um, because we, my mother read them to us every night, my whole childhood, or well, not every night, but very, very often. And um, so it's the, yeah, Brother Grimm language that um, definitely influenced me. And the um, and then a big influence also from the never ending story by- Michael Ende. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, the it, you mentioned Anderson, the Snow Queen. I, I feel like I can very, I hadn't thought of that, but I could very easily see um, the Snow Queen behind your story. Man, I hadn't thought of that, but as soon as you said that, like I can totally see, I mean, and then the babes in the woods, like the, um, just like the, the part of the story where you're, you know, drunkenly wandering around. Um, it, it does feel like a nightmarish fairy tale and the kind of the, the sort of, um, man, I, I can't believe that I didn't put that together, but like, it, it makes complete sense to me that the fairy tales would be the, a, a big part of your influence. And I now I'm I'm reading to my children. I read. I don't know if she's famous in um, in the USA. Is um, uh, do you know Astrid Lindgren? She's yeah, the of course. British writer, and she is. Um, and I'm reading. What's the English translation? Is it's called a German? It's called uh, Ronja Räubertochter. Ronja, the robber's daughter. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm reading it to my children at the moment, and I thought. The, the relationship she has to her father because they break. I was wondering if this was a road that I, I followed when I broke with God, you know, but because I think it, um, these stories really influence you. That's, a, that's an amazing thought. Uh, that's, that, that book is uh, one of my kids' favorites as well. And, uh, she, so Rania breaks with her, her father when she realizes that he's cruel, right? And then she has to find a way of, of, of loving him. Yeah, and she suffers from 
having to hate him. Yeah. Well, thank you, Esther, for joining us. And uh, if you, to our listeners, if you didn't catch Susanna and my enthusiasm for this book, which is in some way as hard to describe as a fairy tale, we can only urge you uh, read the excerpt that's in Plow and then uh, please consider getting the book. You'll do yourself a favor. It's one of the books that has stuck with me most that I've read over the last few years. Spirello di Sarego Alighieri is an Italian astronomer. Since 1990, he was at the Arachetri Astrophysical Observatory in Florence, Italy, focusing on, on extragalactic research, cosmology, the evolution of galaxies, that sort of thing. More recently, having retired, his interest has turned to his ancestor, the poet Dante Alighieri. This past year was the 700th year th- since Dante's death, and to mark the occasion, he wrote a book, The Sun and the Other Stars of Dante Alighieri, which has just been translated into English. Welcome, Spirello. I would describe this book as a kind of hitchhiker's guide to the cosmos or traveler's guide to the cosmos as Dante understood it. So one of the things that was really interesting to me in the book uh, was that you talk not just about the history of astronomy or the history of cosmology as Dante had understood it, starting from the pre-Socratics, but also about the sort of political and um, sort of the political history of Italy at his time and of Europe. First of all, I should say a few things. When when I was asked to write the book by um, a person I know quite well, who's really an expert of Dante, I thought about it and I said, well, maybe I can do it. But I thought that the book should have an introduction about the, at least about the history of astronomy up until Dante. And since I'm not an expert about history of astronomy, I, I thought about a colleague who, who actually is expert. So Massimo Capaccioli, Marco Otto, who was a really nice person. Um, he wrote the parts on, well, in Italian, he wrote the part on the history of astronomy, and then also on astrology and parallel universes. It, for for the English uh, version, we thought we should add something uh, for the you know international public because Italians they do know about Dante about Dante's times more or less. So it was it wasn't so necessary that we and we hadn't, we hadn't written an historical introduction, but we, we thought we should do it for the English version. So, and also the historical introduction was written by Massimo Capaccioli, my co-author. You did get, I mean, this is sort of a little bit of a sidetrack, but if, if not for sidetracks, why are we here? Um, one of the things that I heard that you were up to during this year was a reenactment of the trial, of the corruption trial. Can you tell us about that? That sounded fun. Yes, that's quite funny. I think it was in in the in in the fall of 2019 that I got uh, contacted by a lawyer in Florence. Actually, so so and the, the lawyer Alessandro Traversi is his name. He's, he's a quite a uh, famous lawyer in, in Florence. So anyway, they contacted me and they. Uh, uh, they suggest, well, uh, you know, there is this centennial and uh, uh, we are thinking about making um, uh, a revision of the motivations for Dante's condemnation. How do you say it? I don't know the English word. I mean, the, the condemnation. Yeah. The, so I the said, verdict. Well, well, why not? Uh, this looks funny. I- immediately, I took this as a as a amusement, if you like. No, of, of course, the, there could be no practical effect, clearly, and Dante does not need it either. I thought, well, yes, why not? Well, let's do it. Uh, and and uh, finally, well, well, I thought, well, 
if, if they invite me at this um, discussion about the motivation for Dan doing Dante's trials, they should also invite uh, a descendant of Cante Gabrielli. Cante Gabrielli was the Podesta in Florence, who actually was the judge during Dante's trial. He's, he's the one who condemned uh -huh. Dante two times. And he, 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 Cante Gabrielli was from Gubbio, so a town not very far from where I live in Perugia, is a town in Umbria, because it was a usual thing that the Podesta of the city would be from outside, not to be involved in other things. So Cante Gabrielli was the Podesta in Florence when Dante was, was judged, and I had the venture of meet a descendant of Cante, Gabrielli, <laughs> who's, a, who's a very nice person because in Gubbio, in, in this town, they hold every year a medieval uh, conference, four or five years ago, uh, both me and, and this descendant of Cante, Gabrielli, his name is Antoine because he lives in France. Part of the family of the Gabrielli, they, they moved to France uh, centuries ago. Um, he has a big family. He has like um, seven, eight sons and daughters. They were all here. And um, well, anyway, um, so I suggested, well, look, you have to invite also Antoine. And of course, this they like this and they say, OK, yes, let's invite also Antoine. So I put them in touch. I told Antoine eh? and we were organizing to, to, to do this. Eh? But the, the, the other thing which which is very surprising about all this is that um, I think it was January 2021 when they were already well ahead about organizing this thing. Uh, and on, a, on a Saturday afternoon, uh, Alessandro Traversi, the, the lawyer, he phoned me uh, and he said, well, um, look, uh, the Corriere della Sera, you know, the Corriere della Sera is the uh, biggest newspapers in Italy. Uh, they, they want to make an article about our event. I say, okay, well, yes, why not? Good. Uh, yes, and they want to, to publish something that you say, I mean, some words from you. Well, I said, okay. Uh, I think, well, then the best thing is you, you put me in touch with the journalist and then uh, we can talk together and he can listen to me and, and write. Okay, so the, maybe, I don't know, a couple of hours later, this journalist phoned me and, well, <laughs> I immediately understood that he was trying to say that I had promoted a revision of Dante's trials. Which oh, is like you wrong. were wrong. Oh. Completely wrong. I mean, it's not true. Yeah. I, I didn't promote anything. I was invited to participate, which is completely different. I made it very clear to, to this uh, journalist that I didn't promote anything. I was just invited, and I, I find this as an amusement. Uh, anyway, the next day, <laughs> The, the, the newspaper came out, the Corriere della Sera, and, and a, a full page, you know, not, not the first page, but inside, a full page about our event. And the title was Dante's Descendants Asks for a Revision of Dante's... Come on! Oh, man! Come on! No, it's not true. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I... Um, you know, I know quite a few people. So, I phoned... In, I phoned uh, Gian Antonio Stella. Gian Antonio Stella is a, is a journalist who writes for the Corriere della Sera. And I told him, well, look, in the Corriere della Sera, they've written this, but uh, it's not true. I mean, I didn't say it, and I, I think this is completely wrong. Uh, well, then he said, well, okay, let me, let me deal with it. Uh, then a, a few hours later, I was phoned by the head of this journalist. I mean, the head of the chronic, the section in the journal where, where this article had appeared. 
And uh, well, he said, well, oh, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Well, you're very sorry. But <laughs> and, then, and then he said, well, you can write. We will publish uh, your revision of the thing, which, which I wrote. Um, I wrote a revision, but you know, revision was something, of course, very short. Uh, and right, and it appears in a little it. sort of thing nobody at the bottom. But anyway, yeah. anyway, yeah. but <laughs> they, 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 there are two funny things uh, about this after this. Well, the first thing is that uh, on the day after that, when say the Corriere la Sera appeared on Monday, on Tuesday there were papers on the Times and the Guardian who had just taken the news from the Corriere della Sera and reproduced it. This is terrible journalism. This made me very, very, um, well, amused in a sense, because I always thought that the British press, British newspapers are very serious. They're Careful. Very good. They check news. They didn't do anything like that. If you, if you go with just my first name, Sperello, on on internet, you found my phone number. Hmm? So for any serious journalist, it would be very easy to- Fact checking. You know, there Fact is a checking news is about me, you just type my name and you get my phone number, you check it. Huh? They didn't. They just so reproduced it. I wrote to the Times and the Guardian complaining for this. The other funny thing is that Spanish newspapers had checked with me before there you go. they did you know spanish you know the the, the bloody spanish <laughs> huh? come on come on british press well, speaking on behalf head. of my profession i apologize that, that's that's uh, um, americans um, i don't i don't remember let's say i don't remember uh, anyway uh, <laughs> but the other thing is that some days later the journalist, the Italian journalist, who had written the, um, the, um, the article, misinterpreting my words, or actually completely wrong. Anyway, he phoned me and he said, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry. But, you know, I just um, reproduced what the lawyer told me, Alessandro Traversi. And oh. then he, he sent me by email uh, um, something that Alessandro Traversi had written to him, exactly saying that I was the one who had asked for the, for the revision of the trial. The plot thickens. <laughs> well, you know, lawyers, well, I don't, I don't want to say anything, <laughs> but, but, but anyway... The, <laughs> But there, there is something to be understood about this. And it, it is, everything comes from the sense of guilt of the Florentine people about Dante. Huh? They felt guilty almost immediately after putting him in, in exile, you know, because he, he got famous very, very soon and much more famous than most other Florentine people. And they had sent him away. He's buried in Ravenna, not in Florence, because he, he died in Ravenna. He was exiled, so he couldn't die in Florence, of course. He died in Ravenna. His, uh, at least two sons of him were there when he died, and he was buried there, of course. And, but the Florentine people have tried for centuries to get the rest of Dante back to Florence. Oh, right, the, 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 um, the urn with his ashes. In, in, in Santa Croce, which is a main church in Firenze, there is a mausoleum for Dante inside the church, together with Galileo, Marconi, and other people. There is a mausoleum for Dante, but it's empty, you know. <laughs> so the Florentine people have really a big sense of guilt about, huh. about what they've done to Dante. So, and you know, um, the lawyer, I, I, I understood this later, legally, 
a descendant can ask for a revision of the trial, although this doesn't have any effect, but a descendant can do it. And a descendant can ask for the rest of his ancestor to be moved somewhere else. Okay, ah. this is legally, legally foreseen. So this is what they were aiming at. They were trying to clear Florence's conscience. Yes, Florence, exactly. A exactly. representative, you know, yeah. What? I mean, they, <laughs> we've, we've been asked in the centuries, our, my family has been asked many times whether we wanted to move the rest of Dante from Ravenna elsewhere. And we, uh, my, my family always said, no, why? why? There's no reason. And also, also, there is no reason for me to change the idea. You know, all this is, is, is so, <laughs> I mean, has, has reasons. Although mm, they are not, uh, I mean, very, anyway, uh, what can I say? Uh, anyway, uh, so w after that, of course, I thought, well, to the hell with, uh, with Alessandro Traversi and his meeting. With lawyers first, and journalists. This. First I thought this, but then I said, well, no, I better go there to see what they do. And so eventually I did. And, and of course I went with Antoine. Uh, we are very close friends. So, and in fact, the meeting in the end was, was correct. They didn't, because I had, I had warned very seriously Alessandro Traversi about not to try to do anything wrong. But so that's the story. Uh, and uh, oh, that's amazing. Let me say one more thing, which is actually very, very important. Very important. I think it's yeah. one of the most important things that I say in, in my conferences. It's, it's the fact that Dante, um, being a medieval man and being a genius, he could, he could master in his mind all the knowledge available at this time. Okay. Right. And all well, you know, be well. And this is something which is very important to understand if you want to understand Dante. Because later on, this couldn't happen anymore. Be because, of course, the, every field of knowledge has developed since Dante. And so, he, he, it would not be possible now for somebody to comprehend, master all the knowledge well. It's impossible. So we, we people who, has, who deal with knowledge, with, you know, we have to specialize. If we want to say something right. new, if we want to, to work on it, we, we have to specialize on something. We cannot, we cannot uh, keep a broad view. Um, and so this is what uh, all of us do. But what, what th this means that in order to understand Dante, you cannot listen just to one person because that person would tell you about what he is expert about, but he could not tell you about other things. For example, about astronomy. If he's not an astronomer, you should not trust People who tell you, I know everything about Dante. It's impossible. Because, and you know, for example, and so wh when I talk about Dante, I always make it very clear that I'm only talking about one of the many aspects of Dante's poetry, knowledge, and etc. But there are many, many more. And for those, you should listen to other people. Uh, and it, so this is, is very obvious. Well, it's obvious, but not many people, not everybody understands it. Um, so I think it's, it's important to point this out that you have to yeah. listen to, 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 to different people. There was one um, thing in the book that I felt as though you were probably just about the only person who might have picked up on. Um, you know, there are so many aspects of the book that were just sort of fun and interesting and like, it was like a tour guide. Um, but then in chapter 13, you talk about the possibility that Dante imagined by some sort of stroke of cosmic imagination or, you know, strange mathematical insight, the idea of the universe as curved as a kind of a Einsteinian hypersphere. 
Yes, this, this has I to do that. with the with the whole structure of Dante's universe. The structure of Dante's universe starts from the universe of Ptolemeo, you know, the Greek Ptolemeo, with, with the earth at, at the center of the universe, and then nine spheres turning. So the earth is fixed in the center and, and nine spheres turn around the earth. So the moon, uh, Mercury, uh, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, the fixed stars, and, and uh, uh, the, the primo mobile. Okay, so these are the nine spheres, which actually, well, apart from the primo mobile, all the others come from from Ptolemeo. So that's that structure is from Ptolemeo. But the 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 nice thing and and uh, that, Actually, the, the very surprising thing is that actually Dante extends that structure beyond the, the, the primo mobile. Uh, <clears throat> so what happens is that when Dante gets to the primo mobile with Beatrice, um, um, he looks back and sees all the spheres, you know, with with the earth down far at the center, okay? Then this is the end of the, uh, I think it's the 27th canto of the paradise. Uh, then at the beginning of, of the next, so the 28th, he, he looks at the other side and he sees something symmetric, completely symmetric. So nine spheres, one inside the other with a, a, a very bright point at the center, which is God, okay? So, so that's, that's the way that Dante explains it. Uh, of course, there are other details, but we will come to that. Uh, but this symmetric structure, immediately after Einstein, there was a there was a Swiss uh, mathematician, physician, physician mathematician, um, Andreas Speiser. He wrote an article in German pointing out the similarity between the structure of Dante's universe and uh, uh, Einstein's hy hypersphere. And then, so this was uh, 1925. Huh? You know, Dante's, um, Einstein's theory of general relativity is 1915. So right. only 10 years later, not, not not very much later. So immediately, in fact, very soon, people noticed. And in fact, there is a very nice article by an American mathematician, physics, mathematics, um, Mark Peterson, who appeared in the American Journal of Physics in uh, 1979, I think, yes. Um, and Mark Peterson, of course, he, he refers to Andreas Peiser, he knew about that. And he, he, his article is really very nice. Of course, he, he puts some of the equation of, uh, Dan, of Einstein's hypersphere, but he, he cites also all the, the, the parts of the Divine Comedy where the similarity appears. What's important is the fact that uh, Dante in the Divine Comedy, he says that it doesn't matter where they've reached the primo mobile, Beatrice and him, it doesn't matter. On the other side, they would have seen the same thing. Hmm? Yeah. This is very interesting because it's, it is actually linked to the hypersphere concept. So the question is, how could Dante get to this? Huh? He didn't know about Einstein, of course not. Uh, how could he get to this? And, and the answer, I mean, the answer, the, let's say tentative answer, but I'm quite sure, anyway, has to deal with the <laughs> fact. <laughs> <coughs> So the answer has to deal with the fact that in medieval times, spherical geometry 
was, was quite well known, probably even better than Euclidean geometry. Hmm? <clears throat> I, I explain you briefly. <clears throat> Euclidean geometry has to do with pa parallel uh, yeah, uh, cubes, uh, the theorem of Pythagoras, uh, and other things like this, okay? We all know about that. Spherical geometry is completely different. It, it deals with the geometry on the surface of a sphere, for example, yeah? Like the surface of the Earth. <coughs> and on the surface of the Earth, there are no parallels. You know, a line on a sphere is, is a maximum circle. And there are right. all maximum circles cross each other. Yeah? So there are no parallels. Yeah. The, right. if, if, you take, if you take a triangle on a sphere, the sum of the angles is more than 180 degrees, like it is right. in Euclidean geometry. Pythagorean theorem does not hold. So it's, it is completely different. One has to realize this. So at medieval times, it was well known. Why? Because it is the geometry where we move, where we build, where we travel, where we, you know, everything. It's, it's the surface of the earth. So it is important. And also the other thing is that Dante knew about it also because he had been a, pu a pupil of Brunetto Latini. Brunetto Latini was his master, uh, and Brunetto Latini had written uh, um, a work, a book, which is called uh, the, the Treasure. He had written it both in Italian and, and in old French. And it's an it's a, it's a encyclopedic book, so it deals with many, many different things. And he also deals with uh, uh, spherical geometry. And it is interesting. The way he deals with it is not looking at the sphere from outside, by being, but being on a sphere, like we all, like we all do. He makes this example. Let's take two, two horse riders, OK? They live from the same point in two different directions. Hmm? Well, if forget about seas and mountains, it doesn't matter. They, they go and they would meet on the opposite side. Huh? If, right. if we continue, they would meet uh, where they started from. It's clear, no? It's very, very easy yeah. to understand. And, and this, this concept was very clear to Dante. Of course, he, he could understand it. There's no problem in understanding this. But let's move one little step further. Let's make this example. Take the Earth. Take one rider or one man or one ant, whatever you want. Lee uh, on the North Pole, okay? On the North Pole. Then we, whichever direction he moves, he would go south. There is no other way. Hmm? And, and what happens? What happens? He moves going south and he crosses circle, circles of increasing sides, the parallels, okay? Until he reaches the equator, the biggest one. Hmm? Now, be careful. If you put one parallel every 10 degrees, you get nine circles from the North Pole to the, to the equator, which is exactly the nine skies of Dante. Yeah. When you get to the equator, it doesn't matter which point of the equator you get to. On the other side, it is the same. Hmm? It is the same. What you'll do, you will cross circles of decreasing size huh? until you get to the South Pole. Right. Hmm? So this, this idea is very simple. Dante could understand it very well, no problem, no problem. So this is how Dante could make his structure. It's very simple. 
I, the way I explained it to you, the way I explained it to you, he could he could do it. He could do, yeah. and he has done it. Of course, this has nothing to yeah. do. He couldn't he couldn't know about hypersphere Einstein. So it's just by chance that uh, hypersphere is similar. But but he could do it. And there there are two more important things. Uh, in Dante's universe, uh, actually, in Ptolemaeus' universe, there was a big problem. Is the fact that at the at the center of the universe you have the Earth, and at the center of the Earth you have Lucifer. You know, a universe with Lucifer at the center could not please Dante and many others right. are in, in his time. So, uh, so the structure that actually Dante imagined solves this problem because at least the universe has two centers. On one side, there's the earth with, um, with Lucifer, but on the other side, and the, there is another center where, 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 where is God. Huh? So a, a big problem solved. You can imagine this. Yeah. So like the three dimensional center is Lucifer, but the fourth dimensional center is God as a, as a point. Mm, no, there are two centers, let's say. And anyway, like, like uh, North Pole and South Pole. Right. Anyway, um, a few more things I want to say. The fourth dimension. The fourth dimension in, in, in Einstein hypersphere has to do with time. So there are, there are three spatial dimension and then there is time as a fourth dimension. And, and, and the way it becomes a dimension is because if you multiply time by the velocity of light, which is a constant, you get a, you get a, a, a space, I mean, a, a dimension, okay? But Dante could not, could not do this. So he, the, the fourth dimension of Dante is not time, but he has a fourth dimension, which is the rotation. Because when you start from the earth, the, the nine spheres rotate quicker and faster and faster, okay? On the other side of the Prima Mobile, they keep rotating faster and faster. So this rotation is an increasing coordinate all the way from the center of the earth to God, okay? And it is a physical coordinate, although in Dante's view, it also has to do with the, you know, the proximity with God and the increase in virtue and, uh, and all that. But it is a physical dimension because he specifically talks about the rotation. Rotation is physical. Hmm? So this is important to understand. And it uh, explains one of the ways in which Dante could combine different aspects of knowledge. So that's why in his vision, the, um, the seraphs, the, the ones who are closest to God are going fastest, right? Yes, about, about this structure. Um, you know, in Dante's time, they were discussing whether God was inside or outside the universe. Hmm? And if God is inside the universe, what there is outside? You know, these are big questions that we can also ask uh, now. Hmm? Dante has solved this because in Dante's structure, God is inside the universe because he is there, he sees it, okay? And outside, there is nothing, nothing. Uh, a way to explain this, I have two ways to explain this. One, go back one dimension. Let's, let's think that we are two-dimensional beings, two-dimensional, huh? uh, and we live on, a, on the surface of a sphere, okay? The sphere, for us, is unlimited. We, cannot, we, can, we can go and not find a limit, right? But it is, it is finite because the sphere has a finite surface, like, I don't know, a million square kilometers, let's say, it's finite. Right. So it's unlimited, but finite. And outside there is nothing because we are two dimensional, okay? Right. So the same goes with Dante's universe, but also it goes the same with our universe, the way we see our universe. 
because you know we think that well we know quite for sure i would say that our universe has started with a with a uh, an event um we, we call it big bang but it's big bang is a is a wrong wrong name it's a it's a it's a singularity if you want okay time uh, it's 13.7 billion years ago uh, space and time started then they didn't exist before hmm? uh, and then the universe started expanding uh, creating stars galaxies and all the rest and then uh, human beings anyway uh, so if you take the, the, our universe is is also unlimited because we can travel and not find a limit but it's finite and there is nothing outside if you if you take if you take a sphere of uh 13.7 billion light years the universe cannot be bigger than that because nothing can expand mm -hmm. faster than light Sparella, this has been so wonderful. Um, would you, just for, for our listeners, would it be possible for you to read, um, what's your favorite passage from, from the poem that has to do with cosmology? What's, what's the passage that is most sort of meaningful to you that has to do with these questions that you've spent your career working on? It's the beginning of, uh, of paradise. Dante and Beatrice, they get to the moon and, and Dante asks Beatrice about the reasons for the moon spots. You know, the moon spots were a serious problem, serious problem, because, you know, the moon is the only uh, night body in the sky where by naked eye you can, you can distinguish something. All the rest are points. Even Jupiter, Mars, they're points, Venus. The only one you can distinguish is the moon. And the moon has spots. Come on, how comes this? They've told us that the sky is perfect, spheres, precision, and everything. And the only one we can see has spots. This is wrong. I mean, why is that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a serious problem. So Dante, <laughs> says, well, now I have Beatrice, I will ask her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the whole canto goes on about, uh, about this question. So this is, uh, is Dante asking Beatrice, ma ditemi, che son li segni bui di questo corpo che la giusa in terra fan di Cain favoleggiare altrui? So essentially Beatrice uh, Dante asked Patricia about the reasons for the for the moon spots, mm. and and Beatrice and, and he goes on and says, "Ella sorrise al quanto." This is very interesting because it, it says she smiled. Hmm? Now, <laughs> when Beatrice smiles, you can bet that there will be something interesting coming. Yeah. <laughs> so, ella sorrise al quanto. E poi, se gli erra l'opinion mi disse di mortal dove la chiave di senso non disserra, certo non ti dovrien punger gli strali d'ammirazione o mai. Poi dietro ai sensi vedi che la ragione a corte l'ali, ma dimmi quel che tu da te ne pensi. Now, here Beatrice, well, first she says, well, uh, be careful because uh, the first thing that comes to your mind is not necessarily the right one which is okay. But then she does something which is, you know, um, very usual, actually. You know, when, when, when a student asks his professor a question, many times the professor will turn the question to the student. And this is what Beatrice does. Ma dimmi quel che tu da te ne pensi. So now Dante has to say something. And he says, e io, Ciò che in appar qua su diverso, credo che fanno i corpi rari e densi. Well, he says, well, the, the, he refers to uh, an old idea 
from uh, from Averroé, Alberto Magno, uh, well, anyway, and 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 which which says that the the reason for the for the for the spots on the moon is that there are different densities inside the moon, okay. And, and then it goes on, but I don't think we have the time to do all. Uh, but anyway, ed ella certo assai vedrai sommerso nel falso il creder tuo, sebbene ascolti l'argomentar che li farò al verso. So Beatrice says, you're completely wrong, listen to me. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> so, and this, this is very interesting because it deals with error, the error. You know, this is a concept that uh, in science is very important, but unfortunately is not so important in other fields. You know, people who make mistakes, uh, they think uh, they don't admit it. Uh, they, they think this is all wrong. I mean, it's uh, something that you should never do. No, no problem. S mistakes are not a problem. Mistakes can, can lead you to improvement, it, but the, 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 the only way to do that is to admit the error, the mistake. If you don't admit the mistakes, there is no way you can improve. Anyway, this would lead us to war and other things. This has been such a lovely conversation as usual. Yes, it's, it's dinner time here. <laughs> Go have dinner. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever else you listen to podcasts. And for a lot more content, check out plow.com for the digital magazine. You can also subscribe. $32 a year will get you the print magazine. Or for $99 a year, you can become a member of Plow. That membership brings a whole range of benefits. Free books, regular calls with the editors, invitations to special events, and the occasional gift. Go to plow.com to learn more. Mm -hmm.